What Colorado football is doing under the direction of Deion Sanders is unprecedented. 50 plus players have departed the program since he took over back in December of 2022. And 52 total players from the high school and transfer portal ranks are coming into the program, the majority of whom are already on the Colorado roster. And all 52 will be on the roster when Colorado takes the field on the road at TCU. And it's fascinating because not only is the coaching staff completely new, not only is the energy surrounding the program completely new, reinvigorated, as evidenced by the fact that over 500,000 people watched the Colorado Spring Game through ESPN, and I think their stadium, Folsom Field, had a sellout, which is amazing, and I think one of the only times, maybe the first time the Colorado Spring Game has had a sellout in its history, Colorado has also completely changed the roster. You look at rlads.com, and Colorado's projected depth chart on rlads.com was last updated on April 26th at 8.47 p.m. Eastern Time. So pretty recent, a few days after the spring game. There are only four players, three on offense, one on defense. There are only four players who are going to be starters, projected currently in the spring, who were with the team last season. All the other projected starters are from the portal. That's crazy. I don't know if you will see that ever in the history of the sport again. I'm not going to say you'll never see it, but I don't know if you ever will. A little bit of a difference there. It's highly unlikely. I don't know how many times this has even happened translating to the professional level. I don't think it's happened often, if ever, that one year later, over, really over 75% of the roster has completely new faces in the starting lineup. That's crazy. That's insane. I think you'd have to go back to some NFL some NFL lockdowns that occurred in the late 1900s. I think you'd have to go back to that. My professional sports knowledge isn't the greatest, and I'm working to improve on that. So let me know if my assessment on that was wrong. But this is something that's unheard of. And I think that there are great pros to it. I think there are also a potential of great cons for it. There are advantages and disadvantages to this happening. And I'm going to mix in this exodus of players from Colorado and this immigration of players to Colorado and mix it in with the spring game and just talk about Colorado football today. And my main takeaway from the spring game, from the transfer portal exodus, And the flocking of players to Deion Sanders is, this is, and it's a rarity. This is something that I think, as I've already stated, won't, probably won't happen again. And it's something that only could have happened given a certain set of circumstances. It's an anomaly. You have Deion Sanders, who has one of the most magnetic personalities in college football, extreme charisma, a great football reputation. Those two things already are rare to have together. But then you put him in Colorado, which is scenic and it's beautiful, has a great campus, but it's it's football history over the past two decades has been that of like Vanderbilt, if not worse, because Vanderbilt actually had some top 25 finishes when James Franklin was there. And given NIL given the transfer portal, all these things happening, and then Dion being able to use his magnetic personality to draw in these players to come to Colorado allows this to happen. If Dion Sanders is at Colorado five years ago, this whole transfer portal business, he'd, he'd get a good amount of transfers for the time, but wouldn't get 32 incoming transfer players. And I think there is a great possibility that number is bigger. It gets bigger. Really. Overall, Colorado has the 21st best recruiting class 
If you include both high school and both the transfer portal and factor it into one class, Colorado has the 21st best class in the nation, according to 24-7 Sports. They have the 30th best high school class, the number one transfer portal class. Not by quality. I think USC, USC, Michigan, LSU, Auburn, and definitely some other SEC schools have a higher quality recruiting class. Georgia, I know, is an extremely high quality recruiting class, but they have much fewer commits. Colorado has 32, 33 transfer portal commits. That's a whole lot of incoming players with college experience. That's a pro. A con is it's a lot of guys from different schools. There's no foundational chemistry. The only foundational chemistry from the transfer portal is the fact that a lot of these incoming transfers, an example is Shadur Sanders, Travis Hunter, but there are several other players from Jackson State who are coming to Colorado to play under the leadership of Deion Sanders as head coach, Sean Lewis as offensive coordinator, and I forget his name, the defensive coordinator, Charles Kelly, who's the former safeties coach in Cody C at Alabama. Charles Kelly is the defensive coordinator. That name nearly escaped me. One of the best recruiters in the country. You look at all of this, and there's a lot of unknowns surrounding Colorado. Just looking at things, not even watching the spring game yet, but just watching the transfer portal, watching recruiting, Colorado's unpredictable. Completely. The beauty of this, is, of course, is Colorado was already so bad, like Josh Pate said, on one of his episodes that covered this a few days ago, that Colorado's already hit the bottom. There's no expectation to win win five, even five, six, seven games in year one. Even two and ten would be an improvement. Three and nine would be an improvement. Given the schedule, I think four and eight or five and seven might even warrant Deion Sanders a nomination for coach of the year. 6-6 Six and six or a seven and five record, in my opinion, Deion Sanders should win Coach of the Year with all the roster attrition, all of the incoming players. Some players like former Michigan player Taylor Upshaw transferred to Colorado and now he's re entered the transfer portal. So there have been there have been players that are coming to Colorado, they get there, and then they decide to leave. There were players that stayed with Deion Sanders and then after the spring game, they decided to leave and just leave the team. There were even some players that did well and performed well in the spring game that have decided to depart the program, a pair of wide receivers for Colorado, which is painful, but Xavier Weaver, Jimmy Horn Jr. is a good wide receiver who didn't get to play in the spring game, I think due to injury. You still have a wide receiver room that does have some playmakers there. So this team... A lot of unknowns. We're going to learn a lot when they play TCU and Nebraska in the first two games because those are two non-conference Power 5 programs. The Pac-12 is going to be very deep, albeit top-heavy this year. So when Colorado plays Arizona, but they also play Utah and programs like Utah and programs like Arizona, the haves and the have-nots of the Pac-12 will also learn a lot. It's a very tough schedule. I want to go over the schedule very quickly with you guys. Colorado's schedule entering 2023, I think, is one of the toughest in the nation. As we already mentioned, they open up on the road at TCU September 2nd. They host Nebraska September 9th, Colorado State September 16th. They travel on the road at Oregon September 23rd, host USC September 30th, They travel on the road to Arizona State October 7th, play in a Friday game against Stanford at home October 13th. They have a bye week the 14th and then travel to UCLA the 28th of October, hosting Oregon State November 4th, Arizona hosting them as well November 11th. They play in another Friday game at Washington State November 17th, and they play at Utah in the Rumble in the Rockies rivalry game to close out the year November 25th. It's an extremely tough schedule. They have 11 Power 5 opponents. And the 12th, 
which isn't the sole non-Power 5 program, is Colorado State, who's a rival. Jay Norvell will be in his second season, and he has a competent quarterback in Clay Millen. So very tough schedule for the Colorado Buffaloes. And this team in Colorado, and this is where we'll get to the spring game, the team's small. They look tiny on both sides of the ball. They have some tempo. They have speed. And I think a lot of that has to do with coaching, especially Sean Lewis and the offense that he runs. But Colorado doesn't have the same run game that Kent State had. They have somewhat of a run game. They have Shadur Sanders, who has some mobility at quarterback. But Colorado, just from a build perspective, especially in the spring game, when they still had Montana Limonius Craig at wide receiver, were more of a passing team, more of a pass attack kind of offense. Travis Hunter looked like by far the best player on the field, looked like an elite player at both wide receiver and corner. I actually, after getting a few nights of rest after watching the spring game and just doing some analysis and thoughts in my own head, I thought he actually looked better at wide receiver than corner. There were a few plays where he just got destroyed at corner by wide receivers from Colorado. And I think that he'll be a great, not dual threat as in like dual threat quarterback, but he'll be a a good two position player. He has the talent to be both an elite cornerback and an elite wide receiver. I don't know if he will be an elite cornerback and an elite wide receiver at the same time in year one at Colorado, but I think he will be good or great at both positions in year one. He'll certainly be a player that sees the field more snap, more total snaps than not if you were to add both offensive and defensive snaps. He will see the field as wide receiver and as a defensive back. No doubt about it, especially given the depth in the situation at Colorado. He's a five-star out of high school, most talented player. No one else on the field compares to him in talent. They just don't. And Shadur Sanders looks like a solid power five quarterback. Had a high completion percentage, averaged more than 10 yards per pass attempt, and had multiple touchdown passes. But part of the reason he looked so good is because the secondary looked like a complete disaster. Looked like a complete disaster. This team, again, is small. On offense, they have some speed and tempo. The defense looks like an absolute nightmare. The offensive line looks, in my opinion, almost to be non-existent. I think it's going to be one of the worst Power 5 O-lines in the country. Not just in the Pac-12, but in the country. Like, when you think of Indiana's offensive line last year in 2021, or or probably Indiana's offensive line this year, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a Colorado offensive line. It's not good. And an offensive line is one of the most important positions in football. I would put it up next to quarterback. If you have good skill players and you have a good quarterback, take, take a look at Nebraska under Scott Frost, who was... 0-2 against Colorado in the Scott Frost era, which is pretty humiliating to say the least. And Colorado is going to be hosting Nebraska this season. It'll be pitting Deion Sanders and Matt Rule, who have coaching experience, but they're first-year head coaches at their respective schools, who are both using the portal, who both operate differently, but, you know, they they seem like, to me, they both seem like genuine guys who believe in what they're doing. They believe in their methods. They're not like they're not a snake oil salesman like Jimbo Fisher, for example. They're going to be matching up. And Scott Frost, Nebraska, always had good skill players. They they always had at least they they had at a minimum okay to above average skill players, okay to above average running backs. They had in Wandale Robinson a good wide receiver slash running back player. They had Anthony Grant in 2022, great running back. They had a deep running back room in 2021 that just suffered through injuries. At tight end, they had Austin Allen and Travis Vokalek. Austin Allen's predecessor at tight end, whose name escapes me, was also an All-Big Ten, I think, honorable mention or higher tight end. At wide receiver, just look at Rondale Robinson. 
Look at Stanley Morgan, who was only there for one year, but still a Scott Frost wide receiver, despite being recruited and mainly developed by Mike Riley. And then at quarterback, look at Adrian Martinez. Adrian Martinez, in my opinion, was an amazing talent at quarterback. You put him at Michigan, you put him at Alabama, you put him at Ohio State, you even put him at Georgia in the James Coley era, you put him at Tom Herman's Texas, or in, in, in the range of, of time where Adrian Martinez was a collegiate player, you give him a better supporting cast, and he's one of the best quarterbacks in the nation. The problem is Nebraska had no offensive line. They couldn't win. It didn't matter that they ran an Oregon offense that schematically was one of the most epic schemes in the nation that was totally more advanced and totally better schematically than Wisconsin or Iowa's offense or maybe even better than Kirk Sharaka in the golden years at Minnesota or Illinois or Northwestern. It didn't matter. They had no offensive line. All those other schools had better offensive lines, which meant that their offense could be more productive. They had a better head coach who made his players better disciplined, so on and so forth. And more importantly, they had great D lines, which would just abuse the living crap out of Nebraska's offensive line. And Colorado's offensive line, again, is not good. And despite the fact that I don't think the Pac-12 is a defensive powerhouse, I think that Oregon adding in many defensive players from the transfer portal, including defensive end Jordan Birch from South Carolina, and Washington, Washington adding, I think, Malik Muhammad at quarterback, at cornerback, and many other players. Washington and Oregon both return a decent amount of defensive production. USC is heavily using the portal. They have Eric Gentry. At linebacker, they're adding Mason Cobbs at linebacker from Oklahoma State. And their D-line, they lost some players there, but they return a lot of their secondary. You look at Washington State, who under Jake Dickert has had a reputation for having good defense. And those teams in the Pac-12 have enough defense to where they will match up well against a poor O-line in Colorado. And Colorado's defense as shown by their secondary, and the fact that whether it's offense or defense, the cohesiveness of the team, the foundation, and the the camaraderie of the team will not be high because of the vast different places that these players are coming from. It's going to take time for the brotherhood, the camaraderie, and the it's going to take time for the team to be glued together, and I think you will see that as the season progresses, Colorado will be one of these teams that at the end of the year, they're much better than they were at the beginning of the year. As the players and starters play more together, they'll become more glued together, they'll function more as a team as the year goes on. Colorado's defense is not stopping Washington or USC or Oregon or UCLA's offense. They're just not doing it. They're not going to be stopping Oregon State's offense either. They're not going to be stopping Utah's offense. They'll struggle to stop Arizona's offense. And I'm, if they play, yeah, they do play Arizona. They do. They won't be stopping those offenses. It's not going to happen. And they will struggle to stop TCU's offense. I think they'll struggle to stop Nebraska's offense. The situation, it's obviously a rebuilding year. It's a year where you get everything established, you, you you really just get everything established. A total of 41 players have transferred out of Colorado since the beginning of April. Since the beginning of April, 41 players have transferred out. And I think that number increased. I think it's now 42 have transferred out of Colorado since the beginning of April. 2023 is going to be a rebuilding year. So from one side of it, there isn't a concern. But on the other side of it, when you have a total of 50 or more players leaving a program and then 52 players coming in, and this hasn't been tested yet, there is some cause for concern. There's no evidence that this is going to work or that this is going to fail. This is a wait-and-see experiment. Only time will tell 
whether this ends in disaster or whether this ends in greatness. I think that Colorado in 2023 will be a disaster. I had them going four and eight, three and six in conference. I had them beating Colorado State, and then I had them beating Arizona State, Stanford, and Arizona, who are among the bottom half of the Pac-12. After watching the spring game, and I have yet to watch many other Pac-12 team spring games, which I am certainly going to do so, I don't know if Colorado will even win four games this season. Now, next season, as Colorado continues to recruit at a high level, I imagine they're going to not they're not going to use the transfer portal to this degree, but they'll continue to use it. I have no doubt that Deion Sanders will continue to use the transfer portal in the coming years. I think that you'll see a massive jump from 2023 to 2024. But for 2023, the people who are saying eight, nine wins with this schedule and with how small this team looks on offense, but especially defense, I don't think so. It's an unrealistic and unfair expectation. More more importantly, unrealistic. There are plenty of unfair expectations that occur and to a certain degree are unreasonable, not unreasonable, but reasonable, yet at the same time unfair expectations. There's an argument for that. It's just not, I don't see how this is a reasonable expectation though. I don't. This isn't like USC where there could be an argument that it's unfair to expect Lincoln Riley to compete for a college football playoff in year one in USC, but at the same time, while being maybe unfair because he's a first-year head coach, it's reasonable because with the transfer portal and with the natural talent that USC has, they have an advantage over the rest of the conference. That's not the case with Colorado. It's going to take time, even with the transfer portal and even with recruiting to build Colorado into a competing Power 5 school. Thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and click the notification bell. If you're listening via Spotify, make sure to follow the channel. I'll see you guys around. Bye.